So let's jump in because we've only got 45 minutes and I'm hoping we can cover a lot of ground. Um, this is meant to be a follow-up to a stream from last year um, where we had Laura Hazard Owen talk about the American market for e-singles and, um, and then we also had the Atavist talk about their publishing as well as the platform that they um, sell. And at the time, um, you know, there were still quite a few players already um, in the mix, um, but it's been a year since and we've seen more Canadian uh, companies start publishing uh, e-singles. So um, it seemed like a good time to get the Canadian perspective on it all and just to see how things are going. So we've got two publishing companies. I guess there's soon going to be one. And, uh, <laughs> and a newspaper on the panel, but they're all doing very different things. So I thought we should start by just hearing a little bit about the different publishing programs. So Nick, why don't you start us off? Well, we, we can't really take credit for being pioneers, both for the reason that you just mentioned, that other people had already um, um, been into this territory, and also because a lot of the impetus behind it came not from us, but from our authors. We, uh, it started, I think, slowly. We started off with um, you know, one author coming and asking whether she could um, put something out quickly um, to, to address something in the news cycle, and we thought that we could accommodate that. And then it seemed that every time we talked to an author after that, he or she would ask whether or not it was possible to do the same thing. And so we were, we were dragged a little bit into this, but I think that as soon as we started talking about this at our, at our pub boards, it's, uh, it turned into a program that, that editors really started to embrace. And uh, Susan and I were just talking about the way that, that uh, publishers like to, to gamble, that there's always an, a very irrational dimension to the, 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 the choices we make and the projects that we take on. And it's, it's, uh, it's becoming harder and harder to justify some of those gambles, I think, as a lot of the really successful a lot of the successes are concentrated in a smaller and smaller number of titles. And, I, and what we found in discussions in-house is that, that having this opportunity to, to publish things that weren't e easily justifiable in those purely commercial terms, that, that it's easier to, to take risks, easier to move quickly, uh, and easier to do the things that we are just personally interested in, right? The uh, um, authors want to pursue what, what's, what is feels urgent to them and, and editors like to pursue things that are that uh, strike their fancy and this kind of a program allowed us to do that without uh, without running into too much trouble with our sales and marketing people and you do fiction and nonfiction is that right that's that's right yeah um, the Toronto Star came to me at the very end of the summer at the weekend before um, uh, Labor Day in fact and asked me if I would help them uh, structure uh, a launch of a long form digital only e-journalism program. Um, they realized that it had uh, as much to do with books as it had to do with news and that it was going to be this odd hybrid where they, need, they had all their newsroom expertise but they needed this kind of bookish piece to it. I was incredibly naive and I sort of thought, Oh, 10,000 words, you know, I'm used to working 85,000 to 100,000 words, 10,000 words a week. Well, let me tell you, producing original content of 10,000 words a week is an unbelievable, delicious, fabulous tyranny. What the, um, <laughs> what the uh, star wanted to achieve with this, there, was an, there were a number of things they wanted to achieve. One, in a, in a day of, of uh, you know the same tumultuous change in newspapers that's happening to our side of the business. They wanted to showcase their newsroom and the fact that they still had an extensive news newsroom. They wanted to give their journalists um, an outlet for longer material than online or print tended to, um, tended to allow them. And they wanted to offer a new and different kind of material to their subscriber base. Other newspapers had done um, assorted ebooks, and uh, but generally they tended to be compilations of already existing articles that they packaged up and they threw out there into the marketplace, um, selling them unit by unit. The thing that the Star decided to do, that to my knowledge no one else has has done yet, is offered as a subscription program, and offer the, fa the and offer the fact that they would they would produce original content 
arising out of the newsroom um, on a weekly basis. Uh, we went from a startup start, like literally standing start to launch in two months because it's a very competitive world and um, they wanted to get the program kind of designed and going before anybody else could, could catch up and, and compete on that particular front. Um, they did an ancillary um, marketing campaign both uh, to the existing subscribers within the star and to the world at large through television spots you may have seen or radio spots and uh, print. Um, the thing that's been really interesting is, you know, it's a very competitive world I'm learning and uh, they still play numbers fairly close to the chest. But one of the things, well, some of the stats I can offer you that are very interesting is of the people who try a trial subscription, the conversion rate is 20%. For someone like me who came out of the old book club days where I knew that you know direct mail response of one and a half to two and a half percent, twenty percent is extraordinary. And on the other side of that coin, um, to show the fact that there actually is a pent up desire for uh, long form uh, journalism uh, well written on, on topics, um, our cancellation rate is only one or two people a week. So uh, we are now we launched in November, we're now into our fourth and fifth month. Our subscriptions grow every week and our cancellations are almost non-existent. It shows that despite what everybody says about you know shrinking attention spans and distraction and all of this other stuff, that people do have um, a real desire for a, a, a deeper attention to certain topics. Um, I think the last thing I would say is um, that the we did uh, ISBNs for each of the formats, and so we've been tracking how people are downloading. And the other interesting thing is we are almost exactly as um, the Pew Internet Survey came out. 40% of our people are downloading the PDFs to their computers, 40% are using EPUB, and 20% Kindle and you know assorted other weird bits. So it's, it's tracking pretty closely to uh, Pew. I think my perspective was uh, when I came to Random House of Canada, which is about 18 months ago, um, Random House of Canada was already some distance into this. Uh, that uh, They published a, a Jack Layton uh, tribute. Um, and I think that that had revealed two things. First of all, some, some uh, learnings about the production process and, and timeliness to market and marketing aspects of the originals, but also have given the organization a taste to do this, which I think synced up with, with some of the author interests that you were, you were expressing as well, that the notion that authors wanted to be able to, to tell stories uh, in this format, or they wanted to be able to bring their expertise to bear on a topic that was in the news. Um, so having that, that organizational appetite um, very much sort of lent impetus to what we ended up doing with Hazlitt and continue to do outside of Hazlitt. Hazlitt, we have a, a very specific opinion on uh, what we're doing with that brand uh, with eOriginals, but Random House of Canada has published other uh, ebook originals and also distributes um, from the US as well. So we kind of have a view to, to several different streams of this. Um, the, other, the thing I would say that all of that has turned us is this is still very much a a developing market in, in Canada and we think about we're thinking about publishing into it in ways that uh, we hope will build it in in distinct ways great okay um, so you, you start developing these programs and then you have to go out with this product and part of the the difficulty I imagine with e-singles is sometimes it's a little bit difficult to signal that it's an e-single and not a full-length book. Um, there are self-published books or deeply discounted books, e-books, um, available that might be of a very similar price point uh, to an e-single. So what do you describe how you're trying to signal um, to readers that you've got something that's a little bit different so that you're meeting expectations? We can talk about you know price point, um, but also maybe packaging. If you're um, developing covers that have a that are really trying to show that this is a different product, whatever it is that you guys are using, what's working, what have you tried? Um, 
whoever wants to go first. Uh, well, I think for us, the most obvious thing is some of the things we've done with, with covers, the things within that, the Hanslet brand, we've given them a, a distinct set of cover treatments with the, with the hope that for people who want to read in this format, that will train them very quickly that something that, that looks like this is just like hopefully the thing you bought two weeks ago and enjoyed then. Um, price we've talked about too, but then you come into a, a challenge with how are you expressing expressing value? Because price does a lot of things in the ebook marketplace. Uh, it, it is that persuasion to purchase, but it also communicates something of value and this, this is kind of intersecting terrains. Uh, if, if we have a investigative reporter who spent months and months working on something, there's a value attached to that and we would, we would like to be able to express that in the price, but then as soon as you price it towards $5, there's a set of conventions that that $5 range is in some ways associated with um, promotional pricing for novels, among other things. So price is a pretty treacherous uh, area to be in when it comes to communicating that. I think um, cover design, copy, and then maybe some other kind of branding strategy to, to try and you know acquire a, a following. I think that's, that's why I'm particularly interested in, in the subscription model. Yeah, we skirted that, obviously, by the subscription model. But another thing that, that we have done um, is we project the length of time it will take someone to read. Do you do uh, that in the description or? Uh, no, it's usually just a little. It's usually just a little tag at the bottom. So okay. we factor. You know, people can read X number of uh, um, pages per. You know, or words per page. Then we extrapolate if it's a ten to twelve thousand word thing. We extrapolate that it's a thirty to forty five minute read, and that is our goal. We set out actually to create a a length that we thought would be what we call the commute read between thirty and forty five minutes. Hmm. Once we try and sell singles, which we also do, we do sell them individually as well in retail, we run into the same pricing issues that, that uh, Hazlitt does. When, <coughs> excuse me, when we started, we were quite worried actually that we would, that the readers would felt that they'd been misled by, by these, if it's the very first sing single that they bought. So the, the initial um, series we had out were, were all uh, excerpts from collections of short stories. So we designed a, a template, which would include the title of the book, and also a, a spot for the, the or sorry, the title of the story, but also a, a, a templated spot for the inclusion of the, the cover of the original uh, collection. So they would see both the, both the title and the original, and that had the, the advantage of being able to push people back in the direction of the entire collection, should they enjoy the story as much as we fully expected them to mm -hmm. do. Uh, for the digital original material, we, we also have a, a template. So we include the orange penguin spine, which immediately identifies it as a, as a penguin product. It's also in keeping with the, the template that, that the, uh, the Penguin US does with their special program. So it's, it, it, it uh, I'm trying to avoid the, using the word trained just because readers may feel reluctant to be trained, but. but None of the readers are watching us right okay. now. <laughs> But we, we we want them to know that that there's a encourage a, recognition. We encourage them to recognize the orange spines. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you do you find that um, we talk a lot about publishing in general uh, having some branding crisis? Um, sounds like e-singles might be a, a a way to correct it. I mean, because you're starting fresh, you're saying you've got all these templated covers and, and, and Robert's talking about very definitive um, Hazlitt covers. Uh, are you guys seeing this as a way to, to experiment with ebook branding and publisher branding in general? Um, is that maybe a, a testing ground or? Uh... I, I don't know that we, ha that we have immediate ambitions for that. I think that a lot will depend on, on the very first massive success. The, as of yet, I'm not aware that there's been anything that's, that's really spiked in, in the Canadian market that has happened in, in the U.S. Here, I think once the once the first one or two have happened, then then people will know to, to start looking for it. I, I I would say that one of the challenges for all of us, regardless of how we're trying to put this material into the marketplace, is it is new and consumers don't really know how to recognize it yet. So one of the real challenges is um, is kind of a an education of the of the, the consumer that this is a different kind of material. One of the things we really grappled with in the creative for for 
the advertising campaign for Star Dispatches was, you know, how in the few words you're given in a 30-second spot or a, or a print ad can you explain something as complicated as brand new, once a week, buck a week, uh, never done before, and, oh yeah, by the way, it's a short read. Like, it's in, a, in terms of advertising messaging, it's an incredibly complicated series of messages you, to get across in a short period of time. And so I think that that's particularly true because of our model, but I think it extrapolates to publishing in general that this is, this is not a form people are yet accustomed to. They don't really know where in the market is to look for it. And explaining what it is in the, you know, whatever it was that we used to say as our stat for how long people stopped at a book jacket in the old days of the bookstore, it's like, you know, 0.3 of a second or whatever. In that amount of time you have to grab people's attention. How do you, how do you um, explain these series of really complicated new ways of buying and looking at content? And I don't think any of us have quite figured it out yet. <laughs> Uh, Robert, yes. have you figured it out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the branding, I mean, I think that the answer to that is pretty clearly yes. I mean, we have a we have a specific idea about the f function that branding can perform in in from the perspective of digital content and online content. Um, I mean, I think uh, if your primary if your primary market in which to sell these is the the ebook storefronts. That are built and maintained by the by the retailers in the space, you're competing for that that merchandising space on a title by title basis, uh, and so not only do you have the the challenge of trying to explain the the book the the individual piece and its content and why somebody should read it, but you're also trying to communicate something about the about the format, uh, and certainly uh, when we launched. Uh, when we launched Hazlitt as an online magazine with associated uh, ebooks, there were a lot of people who were coming in through the magazine and saying, I'm really interested, what do I do now? And I think as an industry, maybe we can lose focus a little bit on the fact that uh, ebooks is actually for somebody who has no idea what an ebook is and doesn't own a device and has never downloaded one of the apps uh, on their phone, uh, it's actually quite a number of conceptual and tactical steps to get through that experience. So there's a, there's a lot of conceptual work. But that's right, inter interrupt. The, no, the, um, the, the author, of course, is the brand that is driving a lot of this stuff. Right. And so, so when it's, when we are publishing, um, you know, a, a, a short from say, John Rawls and Saul, people are coming to that because they want to know what John Rawls and Saul has to say on globalization. Mm -hmm. If it's uh, Guy Gabriel K writing poetry, they're coming to it because it's Guy K, not because they want to read more poetry for the most part. So, okay. so and a, a, as we are, as you say, uh, competing for that, for that merchandising space, again, people are going to, are going to be interested in, in, in seeking that out based on who the author is rather than on, on format or on, on publisher. Right. I, I'd say there's also a, a blockade that uh, we have to overcome. Uh, and that's the, the opinion that's, that's given to ebook publishing uh, by, um, the kind of uh, the review community, I guess I'll put it this way. It's it's hard to you don't see a lot of coverage of digital products getting the same kind of uh, of review coverage in the the, the arts and culture space uh, that you would for something that's in print. I think there's still a, a sort of lingering association that these aren't real books somehow, um, and so while that is still that assumption still in place, and you don't see reviews of of well-written ebook originals, we're essentially go having to go directly to the consumer ourselves to establish this is what these things are. I'm going to show my age. Um, this was a problem that uh, we first grappled with with trade paperback originals too, where the review media would only review hardcovers. It seems to be um, that it's a you know that the review media is a, a is a fairly conservative me medium, and um, and it seems to need to get used to it. I mean, the sad thing, of course, is that we have almost no review media left. Mm -hmm. um, so you're probably better off to be going direct to your customer. Or to... Or to, to Goodreads or, or, or some of the communities of interest. Or alternative forms of, of reviewers, right? Yes. So we, we um, 
have a book coming out uh, next week, and we, we're sen we're sending it not to 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 media people or even necessarily to bloggers, but to people who are likely to be talking about it. So it happens to be a book that that is related to uh, the world of, of hockey in a very tangential way. So we're getting it into the hands of GMs and players and people who have already committed to start tweeting about it. So it's it's yeah. we're probably never going to get the the globe to uh, to review it at least at first. But if you know if Stephen Stamkos is is uh, tweeting about it, then <laughs> we may be further ahead. Well, why don't we get into a little bit more about uh, about promotion then? Um, can you talk about the different ways you've been promoting um, each of your your programs and your 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 one off e singles as well, and and what you're finding is working? Susan, you mentioned um, TV. Spots yes, and, in, yeah. in in the in the beginning push. Um, the star, I mean, it was very novel for me to actually end up in an organization that actually could contemplate television advertising. I mean, it would be still my beating heart. <laughs> but um, they did, you know, they had a lot of contra advertising they could pull back in, so they committed a certain amount, number of, of hard dollars, a certain amount of contra, and they actually designed a campaign because they knew that no one had done this before. The, the idea that it was a subscription program, that it was coming out of a newspaper, that it was original content rather than compilations. All these things meant that there was a lot to tell the outside world. And so they designed an integrated uh, campaign that had uh, radio spots, television spots, um, closed caption, uh, the gatefold, you know, those outside gatefolds on the star, a sticky on the outside of the star. So they did this whole campaign to um, explain the program in general. And um, so, what do you do for the individual titles? Then, then we yeah. also have we in the marketing department. We actually have two ex uh, book publicists, bless their hearts, and they also um, put together the usual book publicity plan for the individual titles. So because of the nature of it's coming every week, um, and it tends to be fairly topical. Sometimes the the stories get picked up, and sometimes they don't. But we do plan an individual publicity campaign for each title. And then, of course, we have the advantage of um, subscription lists that we can also um, solicit. So that's how it's sort of, we did this multi-layered thing. Hmm. <clears throat> Robert, I think, yeah, I th I, for us, uh, in many ways, a similar story in terms of the, the uh, work from our, our marketing publicity department. Um, We've had, uh, of the three Hazlitt originals that we've, that we've published, one of them uh, was by uh, Ivor Tussle on, on Rob Ford, and we, uh, we got it over the, the start line, so to speak, um, I think the, pretty much the day of the first, uh, the first conflict of interest uh, ruling. So we were able to get uh, some, great, um, some great media coverage uh, in which the author himself could participate. Um, and then another one was uh, was Stephen Poole on a uh, sort of anti foodie tirade, uh, which uh, we were able to plug into uh, uh, into radio as a sort of issues piece. So in some ways, I think that that's uh, that plays to the to the strengths of a traditional publisher in that you have those contexts and you have the ability to to position a title or an author um, depending on. The content of the book and particular strengths and knowledge of the author. Do you ever get worried, um, you know, when you're looking for certain coverage because these are shorter than books, um, but while they're longer than articles, do you ever worry about kind of all of the stuff coming out in the review? Is that something you guys have to be careful about? Because in a way, I'm thinking of the um, the Carla Hamolka e single. Um, there was so much coverage about that piece that in a way, uh, I think a lot of people felt like they'd read it without having to buy the, the single. Um, is that something you control or you know, you're just seeing how that, that works out in, in the coverage you get? It, it's something that we, we think about a lot because one of the ways we publicize the books is we do an excerpt in the star. And we've experimented with a whole lot of ways of doing it, including using the grid. Um, and it is an issue. We, one of the comments, some of the comments we have had back 
are you know people feeling even though it's not true even though we're, we never put an excerpt in that gives away the whole story people say well I, I feel like I've read it already so our response that which we have the luxury of doing because of the subscription is we now actually promote the excerpt a week after the subscription release so that we attract new people but we don't alienate the people we already have we uh, in our case all of the uh, almost all of our um, singles are linked with a with a, an analog book so so there's less of a risk that people are going to be talking too much about it because even even if the the uh, the a lot of what's in the in the, in the in the original yeah. um, feels like it's been disclosed. There's always this other vehicle for the, for people to be attracted to. So I, we, we want people to be talking about it, thinking about it as much as, as possible. E-singles for you is kind of like a gateway drug. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we should say we've been talking, I think, about nonfiction, uh, where that, that notion of uh, too much being excerpted or I, that's a, a problem that the industry has generally, I think, in nonfiction. I mean, when mm -hmm. you see an author give a, uh, I see Nathan in the room, and this is one of his favorite topics as well. When an author's given a really compelling 25 minute TED talk that everybody's seen, I think we already have faced that, that balance between is this the benefit of exposure and more and more people hear about it, and maybe buy the book versus was this so much information that you don't need to. Um, but I think it's a different question for, um, for fiction. We'll find out because we're going to publish one in a few weeks. Oh. All right. Um, why don't we turn our attention a little bit to how you you acquire and produce these e-singles? Um, I'm interested to see if you're all going to talk about handling it the same way or if it's a little bit differently. Let's start with acquisitions. Are you taking in a lot of pitches or do you tend to commission them? Um, unless it's it's an excerpt thing, how does how how does the how do you select the material that you're going to make an e-single? Uh, I'm really interested in kind of what happens on the editorial side of that and acquisitions. Um, so if you can each talk about that a little bit. Well, we try to from, from acquisitions all the way through the whole process. We try to treat them as much as possible like any other project. So we we accept acquisitions the same or proposals the same way, talk about it at pub board the same way deal with production in, in Exaki the same way, we just won't end up with a, a physical book in the end. We... Um, or a digital book. So <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry, we won't end up with a physical book. Uh, apart, oh. apart from not having a physical product in your hand, otherwise it, right. it should be exactly the same. We may be a bit more innovative in, in, in going to the authors if we know that, that someone has, say, a prequel in her desk drawer. We might reach out to her in a way we, we might not otherwise but we they're often coming to us with an idea and so we'll, we'll just go to pub board talk about it the same way and then say let's do it mm -hmm. I think because we're doing it weekly which is you know is, is quite a lot of ideas and books to feed into the hopper all the time we do a combination we do a, and also since we are seeking to showcase the newsroom and the fabulous journalists that live in that newsroom um, we tend to do a combination. The writers can come forward to us and say, I've been working on this story and I really think that it'll extrapolate into an ebook. Or we do, um, Alison Uncles, who's the features editor, and I do a lot of um, C, what she calls seeding, where we kind of put ideas out there and uh, see which journalists bite. The, the constancy of what we're doing means you have to do uh, some of each. Do you publish anything from non-star? We have authors? done one freelance piece so far, um, but as a you know, and we will do it. But it is it is really meant to um, be another way of showcasing the newsroom and, and to to sort of uh, allow our readers into a more insider view of journalism. Point of view is actually one of the things we're encouraging uh, the journalists to add to these stories, which is so verboten to them in their. Uh, newspaper life that it's kind of at first they're terrified of it and then they fall in love with it. I mean, I'm allowed to say it, I think. <laughs> mm. I, I think it's fair to say we have we have not had any standard process for any of them. I think every, everyone has has differed, uh, whether that's the, the, the Jack Layton, which was, uh, was commissioned from a number of different writers to come together as a piece. Mm. Um, we've also had 
again, outside of Hazlitt Originals, we've had a, a Roddy Doyle short, which came out of work that he did on his Facebook Facebook wall. Right. Um, we One of the Hazlitt Originals was a writer that we had had a, a long-standing relationship with, and he felt like uh, this would be a good way to deploy some material that he had that he felt worked well together at this length, rather than waiting until he was ready to put it in a book. Um, one of them came out of a partnership with a UK publisher. Um, and then one of them came out of a, of a long-standing relationship that uh, our Hazlitt editor-in-chief had had with, with Ivor Tossel um, when uh, he had been writing columns for the Toronto Standard and they felt like there was an opportunity to take that, that voice and, and put it into a 20,000 word length. So uh, almost deliberately, I think, we've been trying to try different things to see what works. Um, and I hope, that, I hope that we continue to do that. I think that this is something that really exists on the intersection between book publishing and, and magazine and newspaper publishing um, and all kinds of other things as well. And having that intersection, though I think it's fair to say it can be stressful, of completely different processes running up against one another, I think that's one of the things that we need to figure out is as an industry, if we think we perceive a market opportunity, how do we get something there as fast as possible? And it may end up being bits from a, a standard book publishing process, but also bits and pieces that we can drop in from magazine and newspaper publishing as well. And, and if I could add one other thing, that, that is this weird intersection that uh, we've just been talking about in, in terms of thinking about how we do these books once a week. Um, we do think of them almost as a book list in the sense that unlike a newspaper where people can um, decide they don't read an article and skip skip to the next one that does interest them, we are only offering them one thing per week. And so the interest has to be pretty general interest and pretty varied. So it becomes a kind of compressed <coughs> way you actually look at building a, a, a full publisher's list. You know, one week we're going to have human interest, the next we're going to have sports, the next we're going to have, a, you know, a big investigation, the next we're going to have politics, we try to make sure we don't get two sports going back to back. You know, so you, in the weird way, even though it's, Newspaper journalism, the structural aspect of planning is very bookish. Okay, I um, just a couple more questions before we open it up. Um, so it's obviously early days for the Canadian market on e-singles and arguably the e-single market anywhere. Um, so advice for people who, were, who might be thinking of, of, of starting up their own um, e-singles line at the beginning, what? How do you measure success? Is it, is it revenue? Is it profit? Is it just the sales number, um, or just how many people are picking it up? W what is it that, that makes you guys feel good about um, titles? At least, how did you feel about it in the beginning, and and how do you see it kind of changing as you move forward? We don't want anyone else starting up another uh, e-single. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I mean, obviously. Uh, revenue would be the would be the most welcome form of, of feedback. The, uh, <laughs> but it, but it's certainly not the not the only one. I th I think um, having more authors come to us with ideas would be a, a sign that we're doing things right. I mean, uh, everything we've been talking about or um, all the pieces that that we're working on are all things that probably wouldn't have been published in any other format. Right? There's mm -hmm. something unforeseen is going to come out of all of this, and so I think the more we get writers thinking in these terms and, and eventually readers reading in these terms, the more likely, likely we are to have something that, that will reach those, those revenue fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think that uh, it's actually absolutely true. It's a brave new world. Nobody really knows what's going to work. Um, I think that in the early, while revenue is indeed the desired goal, um, there's all kinds of benchmarks in, that are also important. Um, one of which I would say was in, in the case of the subscription, the low cancellation rate. You know, people are happy, they're coming back, they're staying. Um, the fact that um, one of the things we did an instant book, we created it, we usually give the writers like six or seven weeks to write and then I have a two week production window. But in this case, we actually researched, interviewed, and wrote a book on the fall of Chris Spence in six days. And we don't have DRM in our material. And somebody picked it up and put it on the, 
on the Teachers Federation website and we had 35,000 downloads. So, you know, that's an expression too. You know, we would have loved to have had a me. <laughs> but, on the, but on the other hand, it's, it, it speaks to the fact that, that there is an audience. They are growing accustomed to this, but there are no rules yet, I would say. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, the only thing that uh, in any other industry would have the force of the rule is that uh, there's a very strong argument that we shouldn't be doing this right now, especially okay. with nonfiction. I mean, the the growth of the ebook market in Canada, uh, I think it's fair to say, has been fueled by uh, going after the consumer fiction reader. And that market is, is really fiction heavy. So the people who are on those storefronts and using those devices day in and day out are fiction readers. And so, uh, and they're readers of novels. And so publishing short length nonfiction is kind of crazy. Um, but I think that we're all doing it because while we're not necessarily a representative subset of the wider population, we enjoy reading them. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a hunch about, there's a hunch there that, that the consumer will get there. And there's just a bit of training that has to take place, but that there's something uh, very informative at reading something uh, at 10 or 20,000 words that has a really tight theme and subject and focus and authorial voice. Uh, and so producing it now and trying collectively to train a customer, I would actually like a few more competitors in this space because I think that's where we get to people knowing this is a format that they can re reliably read in. So I think we'll, um, I'm just going to throw you a, a great big question to, to end off. Um, what are your predictions for Canadian e-singles over the next five years? Go. <laughs> That's mine. Uh, that's um, I guess I or where do you want it to go I guess is the other way to look at that I think where we want it to go is is a real kind of breakthrough in consumer awareness I mean I'd love to see a, uh, a national newspaper running a an ebook original bestseller list um, fiction and non-fiction because otherwise it's all going to be uh, 199 erotica but um, <laughs> I think for if we can if we can concentrate on consumer awareness and we do so by by collectively publishing high quality writing, um, the the thing that causes me me anxiety is the notion that it might be perceived as a as a way to a kind of quick way to throw some stuff in there that were afterthoughts, things that didn't really work as as books, bits and pieces from archives that you can package up together. Uh, I think that's going to bore customers and will convince organizations that. Uh, there's no sales here and there's no consumer here. I think, I think if we do this well, we do it by publishing high quality and collectively moving the customer. And, and, the, and the writer, I think, as well, right? As the writers, both, both in fiction and nonfiction, as they, they, they yeah. come to master the, the length and the, and the format and that, that, there, that we'll see some incremental growth. And then I think at some point, there's going to, something is going to take off and people will realize that this is, this is, this is a format that they need to start reading. So we're, we'll open it up to Q&A, uh, if anyone's got a question for one of our panelists. I have a question about the publishing landscape and the super duper strong starting to stay in the craft scene as long as they are. Are there publishers in the craft scene or are, are they walking away? So the question was, are um, the book publishers, uh, the, particularly the book publication, um, book publisher operations paying a flat fee or is it royalty based? Royalty based. Yep, same. Um, I, I think I'll talk about this a little bit later on today. There's a lot of experimentation and, and different models about that. Um, but I think if you're uh, if you're approaching it on the model of, of book publishing, then it's the model of book publishing. Yes. I think this goes into the where you see it going and or I mean um, Susan may be speaking in terms of the current room, but in terms of opening I think that it's, I actually think that, that um, it's one of the ways new, newsrooms are, are trying to uh, repurpose how they think about content and therefore 
how they use their journalists as a way that they don't have to have their newsrooms um, any more draconianly than they have had to do to do so. I think in many ways it's it's filling a void that's actually come into play fairly recently. We used to have a whole slew of magazines that did long form journalism and we're down to the walrus in Canada and we're down to a couple in the US. There has always been, I think, a taste for um, so for considered journalism of length, and now there's less outlet for it. And the and the star amongst other newspapers is experimenting as they should with a whole <coughs> host of new ways in which readers may wish to digest their news. And one of the ways is in more in depth than the column inches of prevailing newspapers allow. And um, I think they see it as a way as of reinvigorating the newsroom and, and offering uh, length that, you know, things like the Star Weekly and the, those weekend supplements that used to exist um, once played a part. Yes, Nathan. The question was, why are we calling them e-singles? Um, I I part of, partly because I just used that word today, but I, I think there's quite a few, but go on. Uh, actually, we, we call our specials to avoid that. We, why do you do this, right? I mean, I'm backing this up to Alan Lane introduces the paperback, and, and if, you, if, you, if you're calling them books, there's, I'm calling them books now. Uh, there's these books, uh, paperback books, that are getting expensive. <coughs> It was. It's like fifty thousand words. Well, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's a book. It's a. It's by, by two standards, it's at a, it, it's an exceptional. It's, it's worth it. It's not an unreliably short book. Um, I, I, I would argue. I would argue back. There's always been this distinction. There's always been essays. There's always been novellas. There's always been a way of alerting the reader to the fact that this book may not be of an accustomed length, and we've always had a vocabulary for it. So what, what's your suspicion about essay, novella, et cetera? I mean, I've seen them used, but, but the idea of a, of a, it seems that it's just going to be a constraint. Uh, it's an artificial constraint. There should be nothing stopping the star from doing this. Well, we have come up with a nomenclature. We call them e-reads. Uh, they're e-books. I mean, I'm a retailer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm selling them. Help me out. Just call them e-books. <laughs> So what do you think? Uh, Should we call them e-books instead of e-singles? Do you find it restrictive because Nathan does? Well, but <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that Nathan's selling, Nathan's selling to a book customer. Yeah. Nathan's customers are book customers, uh, whereas I, I think that there are other people here that we can, we can get in the door, and I'm sure Nathan would like them in his door. I, sh um, I should yeah. mention Nathan is director of merchandising at Kobo, so he's, um, he's got a point of view that is quite relevant. Um, so it's it's really worth addressing. <laughs> uh, we we kicked around essay uh, when we launched Hazlitt for sure, but I, I think it's fair to say that the response to that was neutral. Uh, I would have negatively responded to essay on the cover and been trying to sell. Yeah. <laughs> but the so, so, sorry, but the um, there is something I think that's distinct about about the, these original projects and. There, uh, uh, authors, I think, want the the, the freedom to come at subjects, uh, wh whether in fiction or nonfiction, in a way that they might not otherwise. And there are uh, projects that are that, that might not um, be published originally as, as 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 a physical book that we believe are viable as as digital books. Well, and so I'm not disputing viability. I'm just asking: uh, Are we putting our perspective? 
project, just because it was important for you to see the different web screens, doesn't make it in any way significant for customers that it was hard or difficult for you to read their input. But, but wouldn't you say a customer would mm -hmm. like to know more or less that they're buying a short work? No, I understand. I, I, I understand. I, I, there, are other, there are ways to indicate that. I guess what I'm, I'm just trying to... Uh, so I, the, the, the point about uh, whether these things should be produced or not, I'm not saying they should be produced. But the vocabulary seems unuseful to make this distinction because they are just books. They are books that happen to be viable commercially at a shorter length sometimes. That, that needs to be called out too. Sometimes. So is it a, a matter of inference from which a reader can expect a certain type of material? Uh, price to indicate something else? Uh, I just wonder if we're artificially hemming ourselves in with something mm. that's not useful to the consumer. Uh, there are other ways to get, get brand names, like uh, make square covers. Square covers mm. that stand out, they're literally shorter. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying if, if we call them something different, then you'll market them more. <laughs> <laughs> the gauntlet is down. It's also not just a way of indicating this is a unique and exclusive digital only. So if you want a book, you need a Kobo book. If you will help people win, you go to the Kobo book. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why is the Kobo book in this digital only? Kind of. I think one of the catches too about it, they're not always digital only. I think it's Coach House that does a limited print. Mm -hmm. Then do you call them? Yeah, then it, it's a novella or an essay, I suppose. Um, so that's tricky. Let's just make them square. <laughs> We can we can continue this conversation, but there's some oh the red light's not even blinking anymore, so we're gonna have to uh, to wrap this up. Um, thank you very much to the panelists for joining me. Um, it's very thank informative. You.